Hey everyone, so great to have you here. Today I am coming to you from Cape Town in South Africa and I'm going to be showing you the easiest way to make a chat GPT clone using JavaScript. Okay, so JavaScript, HTML and CSS. This is a great project for those wanting to learn how to use API, specifically the chat GPT API in a simple JavaScript project. Now, this is just for demo purposes, okay? We do not want to go and publish this code onto GitHub or deploy it because as we know, right, in a simple JavaScript project without a backend or anything like that, you can't hide your API key. So you don't want anyone taking this API key because if they do, they can rack up loads and loads of money on your account if you have a credit card or anything like that associated with it. So this is just for demo purposes. If you want to know how to build a chat GPT clone with a backend, then I'm going to be releasing the same video, but building this in React with a Node.js backend. Okay. We can, of course, also have a JavaScript front end and a Node.js backend, but I think the React app will be way more fun to build. So what are we waiting for? By the end, you will have this chat GPT clone, which we will be able to build using JavaScript, HTML and CSS. And then we'll be able to ask it questions as well as have a history of all the things we asked it before. So let's do it. Okay, so first off, we're just going to start a new project. I'm in WebStorm, so I'm simply going to select new project and I'm going to select an empty project. So it's being saved in my WebStorm projects directory or folder on my computer. And I'm just going to call it JavaScript chat GPT clone. And I'm going to create. So that's going to spin it up for me. And now I'm just going to add some files. So I'm going to create a new file. It's an HTML file. Let's call it index.html. You don't really need to put that HTML extension in WebStorm, but I'm doing it here for those who are not using WebStorm. And then I have this boilerplate code set up. So if you don't have this boilerplate code set up, please copy it here. And I'm just going to do JavaScript chat GPT clone clone, just like that. And of course, we also need to create some more files. So I'm going to create a JavaScript file called app.js and then also a style sheet. So I'm going to create a new style sheet. Uh, let's call it styles because it holds all our styles dot CSS. So there we go. That is what my project looks like at the moment. I'm just going to make that smaller. So what do we need to put in here? Well, first off, I'm going to create two sections, one for the sidebar and one for the main bit. This is actually not going to take much CSS and HTML at all. So I'm just going to create a section. There's my one section. I'm going to give it the class name of sidebar. Okay, and another section. This one's going to be the main section. So I'm just going to give it a class of main to differentiate the two sections. We can pick them out by their style. Okay, so what's going to go in our sidebar first? Well, in my sidebar, I'm actually going to have a button that says new chat and it's going to clear our input. Okay, our search input. After that, I'm also going to have a div and this is going to hold my history. Okay, so all the previous uh, commands that we wrote and I'm just going to style it up a bit. So I'm going to give it the class of history like so. You don't have to use the same style names, but you know, for the sake of the tutorial, maybe copy along and you can change them later. Next, I'm going to create a div and this is going to hold my nav items. So I'm going to give it the class of nav. And then for now, I'm just going to have a P element that says made by Anya. You can, of course, add as many elements in here as you want. You can put in links and so on, but I'm just going to have this. And now in my main section, I'm going to have an H1 element that says Anya GPT because that's what I'm calling my clone. Then under here, I'm going to have a P element that is just going to show the output of my search. So I'm going to give this the ID of output so we can pick it out just like so. So that's one tag and another tag. And after that, I'm going to have a div. And this div is going to hold a few things. It's going to hold the input and then a little button to submit our query, right? So I'm going to give this the class of bottom section so we can pick it out. And in here, I'm going to have a div. And this is actually going to hold my input and my submit icon, essentially. So let's also give this the class of 
input container. And then in here, I'm just going to put in an input element, just a self-closing element, and a div. And this div is going to have the ID of submit. So just like that. Now under, so this is a child of the main section. This is a child. This whole thing is a child. I'm going to also put a P element. Uh, and this is just going to be some sub info. So let's give it the class of info so we can make the text smaller by picking out this element. And then I'm just going to put chat GPT. This is just from the website itself, March 14 version. In fact, I'm just going to paste it so we don't have to write it all out. But of course, you can pause here if you want to have this full text right here. So that is what that text is going to say. OK, so actually now we are done with the HTML part. Please pause here uh, to have a look at it or slow it down. But essentially, that's it. Maybe if I zoom out for some of you, you can see everything. That is everything, OK, with the correct formatting. Wonderful. So at the moment, if we open this up in WebStorm, I can just click here and that will bring everything up. And if I inspect the page, you will see that section that we made. So there's our section. There's the other section with all the stuff inside of it. OK, so now let's get to styling up. The first thing I want to do is make sure the sidebars on the left and the main section is on the right. And for that, we need to link up our style sheet. And I'm going to link up the JavaScript file while we're at it. For those of you who aren't using WebStorm, you can view this by getting the index HTML page, copying the path, copying the absolute path, and just pasting in here like so. It's the same thing. Great. So let's carry on. So let's link up our style sheet first. I'm just going to go link and I'm going to use rel. I'm just going to minimize this style sheet just like so and then href and I'm going to link this to the style CSS file which is in the same place as this file so we don't need to go into any folders or anything like that we just get the file name and like I said let's also do the script tag at the bottom to link up our JavaScript so make sure it's at the end so after all these other uh, elements have been read. Then we want to read this script. And there we go. So great. Let's get up our star sheet. So first off, I'm going to get the whole body. So the thing that everything is in. And I'm just going to get rid of the default styling by adding margin and padding zero, just like so. Next, I'm also going to give it a background color. Now, this background color I actually picked out from the website itself. So there we go. That is it. That's our background color. And now, so at the moment, it will look like this. But these two are still kind of on top of each other. I'm also going to change the font in the whole project. So by adding this star like so, that means everything, everything in my whole entire project is going to have the font color of white, which is hash FFF. OK, you could do three Fs, but you know, this is a shorthand for six Fs. So that's what I have done. So now the text will be white. And to make this section to so the sidebar section and the main section appear left and right of each other, we're going to use display flex. So all I'm going to do is on the parent of both of those, which is the body, I'm going to just write display flex and save this file. And there we go. So now the sidebar is there and the main section is there. Wonderful. We still have a bunch more stuff to do, so let's carry on. I'm actually going to import a font while we're here. That font is Open Sans. And for that, we're going to go here and then we're going to go to Google Fonts. OK, and in Google Fonts, I'm going to pick out the Open Sans font. So all I'm going to do is search Open Sans, click on it, and then I'm going to select a few. We can select as many as we want. So let's go ahead. I'm going to select maybe all of these. So basically just not the italic ones so that we have them to our disposal in the project. I'm going to choose to import them via these style sheets. So I'm just going to take this code in between these two style tags. And then in my project, I'm just going to paste it in like so. OK, so there we go. There's the 
uh, semicolon at the end and all the weights to my disposal. And once that is done, that means I can now use the font family open sans. So font family open sans. And then as a backup, I'm going to have sans serif. So if you didn't know which code to use, you can actually get it from here. Here's the CSS rule to apply that family and you just get that one. Great. And that's it. So that just means that that font will now be applied to my project. Let's carry on. So now that we have done that, uh, I'm also going to pick out any H1 elements in my project and assign them a different font size because I don't like the default one. So I'm just going to go font size 33 pixels and a font weight. So we just imported loads of font weights. I want to go with 600. And I'm also going to pad it out. So I'm going to use the padding uh, property. And I'm going to say 200 pixels from the top and bottom and zero from the left and right. So that's a shorthand. Okay, this is top, bottom, and it's the same as me writing this, but because there's repetition, I can remove it. And that will now be applied to the top and bottom and this to the left and right. So if we look at it now, that's what it would look like. There's my H1 element. Great. Now let's actually pick out the sidebar. So I'm picking out an element with a class of sidebar. That dot means class. As you can see here, we're looking here going blah, 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 blah. Ah, here's an element with a class of sidebar. So let's pick out the whole thing. So that's what I have done. Now I'm going to give this a different background color. Again, I have picked this out from the project. So from the actual website itself. And I'm going to say the width of this is going to be 244 pixels. Uh, the height is going to be 100 of the viewport height, so VH, so whatever the browser size is, the height I'm getting it. And I'm also going to make sure that everything inside is going to be stacked on top of each other with equal spacing. So I'm going to use display flex for that. So I'm initializing a flex box. So then I can use flex direction. Okay, without this, this will not work. And I'm going to make sure that everything in the sidebar is a column. So like stacked over each other. So that's what I would use. So if I look at this now, you will see, okay, there's a button, there's basically everything in the sidebar. So this, this, this is stacked on top of each other. But what if I want them to appear equally spaced, right? So that the navbar is all the way at the bottom. This is kind of in the middle spaced out equally between the button and the navbar. Well, I can use justify content space between. So now if I refresh this, there's our p element let's see let's maybe go in here so there's our div with the nav class there's our div with the class of history and there's our button so the spacing between all three is equal and no matter if i change this that space will always be equal no matter how big the browser is so i like that let's carry on let's also now maybe style the main section so the other section uh, once again, I'm going to use display flex and I'm going to use flex direction column just to make sure they're all stacked over each other. But this time I want to align items to the center. So I'm actually aligning them from left to right because we've changed axis of display flex. If none of this makes sense, please do check out my full stack developer course where I go into this in a lot more detail as flexbox can be quite confusing. So that just means I've centered everything from right to left by using align item center. And we're doing it from this axis as we've swapped the axis by actually making them a column. So whatever direction we're going in, if it's a column, align items will be on the opposite axis. Great. So this is looking good so far. Let's carry on. I'm also going to use text align center to make sure that the text is in the center which it is, but now in the bottom part is as well, because at the moment it's being aligned to the left. And once again, I'm going to use justify content space between just to make sure that they are also spread out equally, no matter how I make the browser that will always be at the bottom and this will be pushed to the top. So I'm spacing everything out equally on this axis. Great. So I'm happy with that. The other thing that we need to do is assign this a height. So I'm going to go with height, 100 of the viewport height. So now that text will always be stuck to the bottom because we're taking the browser height into consideration. 
Next, let's style up this text so it's a bit smaller and more transparent. So we gave this the class of info. So let's pick out this whole element, the whole P element by the class name. So I'm just gonna grab the class name of info and I'm gonna make the color of this uh, a transparent. So I'm gonna use RGBA. I'm gonna go with white and then I'm gonna put 0.5. Opacity. So to make it consistent, you might want to consider changing these to be RGB2, just so that we don't have hex colors and RGB colors in the same project. So I might leave that as something I will do at the end. Next, I'm just going to also change the font size to be 11 pixels, because I want it to be a bit smaller. And I'm also going to pad it out. I'm going to give it 10 pixels padding all around. So now my text will look like that. That is much more like the website. Wonderful. Let's carry on. I think next let's also maybe uh, style, what should we style next? I think let's style the input itself. So this thing right here. So I'm just gonna grab the input element. I'm gonna get rid of its default border. So I'm gonna go with border none. And let's go with background color. Again, I think let's just use this color, so like a transparent white. I'm gonna make sure that the width is 100% of the parent container. The font size is gonna be 20 pixels. Let's pad it out. I'm gonna pan out 12 pixels from the top and bottom and 15 pixels from the left and right, and just round off the edges slightly. So I'm gonna do border radius, five pixels. And now I'm going to do border radius five pixels just to round off the edges. Oops, don't forget to have that syntax right there. Okay, and finally, I'm just going to add a box shadow because who doesn't love a box shadow? And this time the color I'm going to go with is RGB black. So that's black. But I want to make it transparent. So I'm going to go 0 0.05 and add A here to give it opacity. I'm going to go zero pixels X axis. 54 pixels y-axis, 55 pixels blur. Uh, we don't need pixels here if it's zero, so we're just gonna get rid of that. And we're gonna overlay it with another color. So actually, I'm just gonna maybe copy this as we're gonna have the same color. However, this time I'm gonna go minus 12 pixels here and then 30 pixels blur. And then again, the same thing. So I'm gonna paste again, and this time I have zero, four, six, so I'm just overlaying different box shadows to get a desired effect that I want, and zero, 12, 13, and maybe let's have one more, so 0 0.09 this time, and this time minus three pixels, y-axis five pixels blur. So that is my whole box shadow, and the effect will be this. And if I type in here, that will happen. We can get rid of this blue line. In fact, I'm going to do that because I really don't like it. So I'm going to say that when the input is focused, we're going to do outline none. So now if we look in here, I have gotten rid of that. So much better. Great. Now this input is stretched out 100% of its parent, which is the input container or the input container I also want to be stretched out I want to make it bigger so let's grab the input container so the element by the class name of input container and I'm also going to make that 100 percent width of its parent I'm also actually going to assign a max width so it's going to try to be a hundred percent but then it's going to stop at 650 pixels okay great this also means that the parent of the input container needs to have some sort of width assigned to it. In fact, we can go and actually give main a width. So let's go make sure that the main element is 100%. And now the child of main is bottom section. So if this is 100%, next I'm gonna get the bottom section And also make sure that width is 100%. Great. And now let's center everything. So main already has display flex on it. 
So we're gonna have to get the bottom section and make sure that everything in the bottom section is also aligned in the center. So let's use display flex. So I'm gonna do display flex, flex direction column, justify content center, align items center. Again, if Flexbox is something you haven't covered before, please consider checking out my full site developer course where we go into this in a lot more detail. So great, so now everything in the bottom section is also centered. How good is that? And if we kind of make this as big or as small as we want, it will always be in the center. Wonderful. So let's carry on. Just a few more styling things to do before we can continue. So next, I'm just going to style up the input container and submit button. So for this, I'm gonna actually go in here and put in a text symbol. So it's this little arrow right here that I've taken off the internet. That's a text symbol. If you wanna get your own, I mean, I'm just gonna Google it so you can see. You can get it from here. So just copy that. That is the URL that you would need. So now if I refresh this, there's a little text symbol. However, I want it here, right? I want it to appear on the actual input itself, which is why I put them both in an input container so that I can position them thanks to position relative and absolute. So let's give the input a position relative, relative to the whole page, so we can use position absolute on these two things to position them based on the parent. So let's do it. Again, this is something that you can learn in my course. So input container, let's give it a position of relative so that we can give the children a position absolute to position them. And I'm gonna get the input container or the element by the class of input container and say that if an element with the ID of submit lives inside of it, that is the syntax for doing so, I'm gonna give it a position of absolute. Okay, so now if I refresh this, that shows up here, and now I'm gonna position it in relation to the input container. So I'm just gonna go right zero, so it should appear on the right zero. So if I save that, there we go. And I'm gonna move up from the bottom 15 pixels. Okay, so the, from the bottom of the parent element. So let's go bottom 15 pixels. So now that should appear right there. And again, it will move based on the input container, so the parent. The other thing I wanna do is change the cursor so that it's obvious I can click on it. So I'm just gonna add cursor pointer, just like so, and save that. And now, my cursor will change so that it will appear that I can click on this. Great, we are so nearly done. I'm just gonna style these things a little bit more. So the button, the history, and the nav uh, container. So let's do it. So the button itself, I'm just gonna give it a border of solid 0.5 pixels and a transparent white. So we know that's 255, 255, 255, 0.5. I'm gonna go with opacity. And then the background color. Let's go with transparent border radius, five pixels, padding, 10 pixels, and margin, 10 pixels to space it out from everything else. So with that styling, this is what my button will now look like. That is much more like the actual website. And the nav, well, I just want a line above it really and to space it out a bit. So I'm gonna get the element that has a class name of nav. We could have maybe used the nav element, but you know, that is up to you. Okay, maybe let's just switch it out. Semantically, that would probably make more sense. So if we go ahead and get rid of this whole class and just use a nav element instead, that is also an option. Okay, and that just means I can pick out the whole nav element and I'm gonna give it a border top of solid 0 0.5 pixels. In fact, it's gonna be the same color as this, so let's pick that out. Oops, just make sure that says 0 0.5. 
So now that will look like this. I've just added a line and I'm just going to space it out. So once again, let's just add the same padding and margin that we did for the button. And finally, let's grab the element that has the class name of history. Also give it the same padding and margin. And I'm also going to use display flex to make sure that anything I put into it, because I'm going to be putting stuff into it with JavaScript, is going to be stacked on top of each other. So I'm going to use flex direction column. And I'm also going to make sure that it takes up 100% of the height that it can. Great. Next, I know that I'm going to be putting uh, P elements into this history. So we're going to be using JavaScript to essentially put elements in here. We're going to be injecting elements with JavaScript and those are going to be P elements. So I'm going to say that any P element that I put that lives inside an element with the class of history. So that is the syntax for doing so. I'm just going to make sure that you can point on it. So I'm going to put cursor pointer and there we go. So our CSS is now done. Now time for the part that I'm sure you've all been waiting for, and that's using the chat GPT API. So let's do it. So I'm just going to head over to openai.com. Of course, you have to sign up. This will be a free service, I believe, up to a certain amount. And I've just opened this up in a new browser so we can differentiate. So here is the URL that you need to be in. As you can see, I am logged in. It's platform.openai.com docs introduction. And if you go to API reference, all you're going to need to do is get your open API key. So under authentication, if you actually visit your API keys here, you can create a new key. So this is one I made before. Let's go ahead and create a new one. So this is the thing that you need to keep safe, okay? Because if you attach a credit card to this, someone will be able to take it and rack up loads of money on your credit card. Or even if you don't, maybe someone will use it and then you won't be able to use any free generations anymore. So keep this safe. And of course, we are putting in this in our project, but please don't upload this onto GitHub or share it with anyone. This is just for demo purposes. If you want to learn how to actually deploy this app uh, and keep your API key safe, then we'll do that in the next video where I show you how to make the same thing, but in React, by building out a Node.js backend. Okay, again, as I said, you can build out a front end in JavaScript and use a Node.js backend too. So both options are viable. Okay, so let's carry on. So once we have that API key, well, we're actually going to go back to API references and we're going to look at completions. So click on completions because this is the URL that we're going to have to post to. So that's what we're going to do along with passing our, along our open API key, thanks to an authorization header, and then as well as the text or the prompt that we want to pass onto the open AI API. So let's do it. I'm going to show you how. So in your app.js file, I'm going to save this as API key. I will be disabling this, so don't try to use it because it won't work. Uh, I'm just showing you this for now. I'm just going to put in this text just so it's super obvious to everyone not to deploy it or upload it onto GitHub. Next, I'm going to write a function. This is going to be an async function. Okay, so you can write it like this if you want or you can use const. It's totally up to you. You can make it a function declaration or just a functional expression. That choice is yours. And I'm going to use get message. I'm going to call it get message because that's essentially what we are doing. And I'm going to use try and catch to try do something and catch any errors. So this is the syntax for this. If you haven't seen it before, this is how we can make calls. Now, I'm going to hook this up to the submit button. So if we click on this div with the ID of submit, I essentially want to make that call. So let's pick it out. So all I'm going to do is go const submit button. So we're saving it as submit button so we can use it in our JavaScript file. I'm going to look in my document, look in my whole document for an element. So I'm going to use query selector. I'm going to look for something by the ID of submit. So that's what this will do. It will look at my whole document and look for an element that has the ID of submit. So we can use it in our JavaScript file. So I'm going to get that submit button. I'm going to add an event listener and say that if I click on it, then I'm going to call the function, the async function, get message. Okay, so that's what that will do. So for now, if I just console log, 
clicked. And then let's go back to this and click on this little thing and check our console. It says clicked. And if I click it again, two, three, four, you'll see how many times we are clicking it. So that's all I have done so far. Now let's get to actually passing stuff on to the API. So what I'm going to do is, well, we're going to use the fetch keyword, right? So I'm going to use await fetch. It's an async method, which is why this is an async function. And we're going to await for its response. So we're going to await it. And the await and async keywords live together. If I use await, that means that that function needs to be an async function. So again, check out my course if this doesn't make any sense. Now I'm going to fetch. Well, this is what I want to fetch. I want to make a post request to this URL. So let's grab this URL because we want to create completions. We don't want to, you know, create images or anything like that, even though we can, but not for this project. That's not what we're going to do. So this is the URL that we're going to do. It's going to the chat and the completions. OK, so make sure to have that one right there. Chat, chat completions. This is the full URL and it's a post request. And this we're going to use this, OK, in order to uh, create our own post request. So we're going to have the content type. We're going to have the authorization, the model and the messages. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's create that data, that information, and I'm going to define it under options. So let's define our options, const options, and we're just going to literally be taking that information. So what I'm going to do is pass the method. We know it's a post method, as we just saw that, making sure that is like this. And we're also going to pass through the headers, which we also just saw. The headers are going to be authorization. So let's grab that, put it in here. And then we're going to do backsticks so we can write code in here because we're going to use our API token. So dollar curly braces is how you'll put in code. And I'm just going to pass through this API key. So that's all I am doing. Next, what else do we need? We need to pass through the content type. So content type, and that is going to be, once again, I'm just going to paste it because I'm lazy application JSON. So that is how you would read what you are seeing here in order to create your own uh, API core in your code. We're also going to have to pass through some more information. So essentially what model we want to use and the message we want to send over. So I can just copy this essentially. Maybe let's do that. And let's do a comma here and do body. And then, whoops, we don't need two of these, so body, and then just paste it like so. So great, we have the model where well, you're going to use GPT 3.5 Turbo, still awaiting GPT 4 or access to it. We're going to have the messages. In fact, we don't need these. We can actually get rid of that, just like that. Same for that, uh, same for the role and same for the content. The content though, we can pass through the string of hello or we can pass whatever we put in our input. So we will do that. And we can also put the maximum number of token words the bot should return if we want, uh, or we don't have to. So you can put max token um, if you wish, but I think let's just leave it. Actually, maybe let's do it just so you know how to do it if you wanna limit the tokens. So max, tokens. I'm going to go with 100. Okay. And I think we just need to pass this through JSON stringify just to make sure it's JSON. So I'm going to pass through that whole object like so. Wonderful. So that is looking good. Okay. So we're making the API core, we're passing through the options so all the information it needs, which is all of this. Now let's get the data. So we're going to use await and we're going to await the responses JSON. So just like so. And then once we have that, let's save it as the const data. OK, so essentially it's doing the fetch and then we're waiting for the response. So let's save this under response. 
And then when we get the response, we're going to get the JSON from it. But uh oh, this is actually an async method, which you might not know, but it is, which is why we need to await it again. And once we have it, we can save it under data. And once we have data, I'm just going to console log out data for you. Great. Uh, and now let's catch any errors. So I'm just going to pass through error. And I'm just going to console error the error. OK, let's test it out. Well, we can just do hello. So that just means that, let's refresh. If I click on this, it will make the call. And we're just waiting for it. And amazing, we just passed through hello. And then this whole object comes back. We're going to go into the object, get the choices, go into the first item in the array, and get the message. So the message is, hello there, how may I assist you? So that's essentially what we want to show in the uh, in the browser, right? So instead of just console logging out the data, what I'm going to do is pick out the output element. So this P element right here by its ID. So let's look in the whole document again, document query selector. This time I'm going to look for the ID of output. Let's save it as output element. So I'm just going to get the output element and I'm going to use text content to get the data. However, go into the object, get the choices. As I said, go into the first item of that array, get the message. So let's have a look here again. So we're getting, this is data, right? That's what we saved as data. We then go into choices, get the first item of the array as that as an array. So go zero and get the message dot content. So we're just going to get that first uh, item back each time. So great. Let's check it out. I'm going to try once more. So obviously this is just sending the string hello. And then we should see hello there. How may I assist you today? So this is looking good. Of course, we want to send our own messages, not just hello, right? So let's carry on. One thing I also want to do is just save it as the history. So if this exists, right, because we don't want to save empty strings, uh, we just want to make sure that if something exists, then what I'm going to do is create a P element, document, create element, and I'm going to create a P element, so a paragraph element, or maybe let's make it, now let's make it a P element, that is fine. Uh, and that P element, I'm going to get the text content and I'm just going to get whatever we actually wrote in the input. So actually, maybe we should do the input first. I'm just going to comment this out for now. I'm going to pick out this input. So document query selector input. We only have one, so it's fine for me just to pick out the whole input. And let's save it as input element. And instead of passing through hello, I'm going to get the input element value. So whatever value that input has will be passed through. And also, I also want to pass it through to history. So if a message comes back to us and it's successful, I want to get the input elements value and just essentially add that text to the P element we just created. However, at the moment, this P element is just floating around. We can't see it. I need to append it to the history element. So let's pick out the element by the class of history. Document query selector class of history. So dot is class. And let's say this as history element. And I'm going to get the history element. And I'm going to use a method called append to put in that P element. So once again, if text comes back to us from the API, then we create a P element. We add some text to it, which is essentially whatever we put in the input. And then we get it and we put it into the history element. So that's all I have done for now. 
So if we have a look at this, let's put in something. Uh, what can I ask it? What day is it? Question mark. And send this. We wait. Okay. Oh, it does not have. I would have thought it would have told me what day it is, but it has not. And we get that in the history. Okay. So if we look in here, the history, the div with the class of history, which before had nothing in it, now has a P element with the text that we wrote in here. Right? So that is pretty cool. And if we, of course, add more, that will be appended to that as well. So this is all looking wonderful so far. We have done a lot. However, we have a few more things to do. I, if I will click on this, I want to bring back the prompt. And if I click on here, I want to clear this input. So let's do that next. Let's pick out the button. So document query selector button. There's only one, so this should be fine. What should we call this? I think we should just call it button element as there is only one in this project. So I'm going to grab the button element. Let's just do so down here. And I'm going to add event listener. And if I click on it, I want to clear the input. So let's write a function called clear input. Let's do so maybe up here, function clear input. And I'm just going to grab the input element, get its value, and just override it with an empty string. So that should now work. One last thing I'm going to do is also add an event listener. So if we click on anything in here, it brings, it essentially gets that text and puts it back in here. So let's do it. I think as soon as we create the P element, right, and we put in the text, I'm also going to add an event listener to it. It says if we click on it, all I want to do, I'm going to make this a callback so just we can, so that we can essentially pass stuff through into a function that I'm going to call change input. So into here, I am, well, let's actually maybe just pass through the P elements text content as that's what we're going to want to change it to. And let's define our function. So let's define it up here, function change input, and then we're going to pass through a value. That value is essentially what we want to change the input to. Uh, and what I'm going to do is use document query selector to look for the element of input again. So whatever the freshest value of it is. So if I'm just going to save it as input element for now and get that input element value and just assign it the value. So there we go. I think we have done it. I think we built our own chat GPT clone. Let's give it a go. So let's ask it something else. How are you today? Send and wait for that to come back. Okay, so there we go. We are getting some text to come back to us and that gets saved up here. And then if I go, what can I ask it now? what is four plus two and send that over the answer is six and then if i click on here that will get back the same question so i don't have to type it out again as you will see that's updating and if i click on here that will or should clear the input why is that not working let's inspect here Let's have a look in here. Ah, we've misspelled value. While we are here, I'm just going to change the OPC of the input to be much more like the actual thing. And I should also check that the input value exists. And if the input value exists and the message that comes back exists, then I only want it to put it in the chat history. So there we go. Let's try that again. Let's refresh. What is six plus two? And that should give me the response. 
out of our U question mark. And that should ask it the question. And then I can bring back the previous input as well as clear this so we can start again. Great, so I hope you've learned something new. I hope you've learned how to use the chat GPT uh, API or otherwise the open AI API that powers chat GPT. As a beginner, it could be quite frustrating when you want to use this, but you haven't learned React yet, so that is how you would do it for your own personal projects. If you want to level up, check out my video on how we build the same thing, but in React next.